Happy Sabbath, Area 6. And to start our worship for this morning, shall we sing Standing Up the Promises of God in number 580. I want it. Brother, this is the Lord's 
At ang ating stewardship talks ay pagkakaloob po sa ating sister Karen Faitan. At ang ating offertory prayer ni Brother Aljan Ramirez. At ang ating pastoral prayer and scripture reading pagkakaloob po ni Brother Brian Dito Gista. Special song ng Gao Church. Ang ating po mga advent from Gao. At ang ating po speaker for the day, Brother Ayas. Kamaka. So yun po ang magiging programa po natin ngayong umaga po ito. Uh, tayo po ay magtutuloy-tuloy hanggang today ay 4.45. So mayroon po tayong mga offering service. And ang ating pong VOY seminar ay hindi po magtatapos ngayong sabado po ito. Hanggang bukas po tayo. Okay? So yun po ang ating mga announcement. Tayo po ay maganda para po sa ating servisyo. Holy, holy, holy.
prayer to your wisdom, bring me all the tides into the storehouse, that there may be need in my house, and bring me now your wit, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open me to the windows of heaven, and pray out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Narito po natin po lang ang dahil dahil po pa pinipin po natin.
Good morning. Welcome to Flight Unashamed. This morning we're going to fly and this building will be the body of the plane. The angels are going to be the wings and the fuel will be faith. The pilot is the Holy Spirit and our destination is at Jesus' feet. And if you have your cell phones on, I need you to put them on flight mode because we're going to fly. So my phone is off. If your phones are on, please put them on flight mode. We don't want to experience any turbulence during this flight. Isn't that right? So please. Now, if you have an old phone that doesn't have flight mode, just turn it off. But don't let people see you. They might laugh at you. So my phone is off. Are we ready? Yes. How about you guys there at the back? Are we ready? Yes. Phones on flight mode? Yes. Let's take off. Father, please have mercy upon us. And may you manifest yourself in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, our key text is 20 to 21. It was well read. I'm going to read it again as we take off on this flight. Verse 20 says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame. What's the title of our sermon? Unashamed. And that is also our theme, unashamed. That I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This letter was written by Paul, and according to the last chapter, he says in one of the last verses to the church of Philippians, I send you greetings from Caesar's household. Caesar's household was in Rome. So this letter was written by Paul when he was in Rome. That's when he writes this letter. It's interesting that he says, I sent you the saints in Caesar's household send you greetings. Caesar was not a Christian. The Romans were pagans. And Paul was in Rome as a prisoner. But because he says, I send you greetings from Caesar's household, that implies that when Paul was in Rome and he was a prisoner, he managed somehow, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to minister to those who were in, in Caesar's household. And even the prisoners became saints and they got to know about Jesus Christ. He's writing from a prison. And in this letter if you look at verse 18 he says what then only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth christ is proclaimed and this i rejoice and then he says again yes i will rejoice he's writing from a prison and he says that he's rejoicing not only is he rejoicing but he's encouraging those who are not in prison to rejoice he is a prisoner comforting those who are not in prison. Some say that Paul was the most influential Christian. I don't think so. And I don't think he was the most influential person in the Bible or in the New Testament. Out of the 27 books in the New Testament, he has written 16. That's including the book of Hebrews. There's no one that has written more books in the canons than Paul. Most of the books in the New Testament, more than 50% are written by Paul. He was a very influential person. In fact, the book of Acts, 
which is the first book that comes after the Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have what? And Romans. The book of Acts, which comes after the, the, the Gospels, from verse 1 to verse 6, is a history of the church, and Paul is not mentioned in there. The whole book of Acts is actually a history of the church after Jesus Christ resurrected. If you want to know how the church was run, if you want to know what happened to the church after Jesus Christ arose from the dead, you go to the book of Acts. But it's interesting. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. From verse chapter 1, you hear nothing about Paul. All the way to chapter 7. Chapter 7 verse 28 tells us that Saul was holding the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen. That's the first time he's mentioned. And from that time on, he takes over the book of Acts. From chapter 8 to chapter 28, Paul steals the spotlight of the book of Acts. And it's about his missionary journey, how the Lord sent him abroad. For example, in Acts chapter 13, the Bible says that the church gathered together in Antioch to fast and to pray. And then the Holy Spirit came while they were fasting and praying and said, separate for me Paul and Barnabas because I want to send them to the Gentiles. And so Paul packed his bag and he departed and he preached the gospel throughout Asia Minor. And Asia has never been the same. Not only Asia, but the world has never been the same. I want to introduce to you what God did through Paul. Many people preach on Paul, but their sermons are not Christ-centered. You see, there are only two types of sermon, Christ-centered and people-centered. A Christ-centered sermon points to Christ. You can preach a good sermon on Daniel, but it is not Christ-centered because at the end when people leave, they want to be like Daniel. Paul was influential. But Paul was only influential because he had an encounter with someone. And that is the person I want to preach to you today. My sermon is not on Paul. My sermon is on Christ. And what Christ did and what Christ can do through you. And so in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20, Paul says, According to my earnest expectation and hope. What is his hope? that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ, even now as always, will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. To Paul, as long as he was alive, he only wanted to glorify God. And to Paul, if I'm going to go out, I will go out glorifying God. If I am alive, I will glorify God. And if I die, I will go out in a way that God is glorified. And then he says, for me to live is Christ. To live without living with Christ and without living for Christ is vanity. It's useless. It makes no sense. And then he says, to die is gain. He goes on in verse 23, he says, but I am hard pressed from both directions, <laughs> having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Meaning, I would love to go to heaven and be at peace and be with Christ. I would love that. But then Paul says in verse um, 24, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. I would love to be in heaven right now and enjoy the peace and comfort of heaven and the presence of Christ. But I would rather right now stay here on earth for your sake, for the sake of preaching the gospel. Paul was a man who was not self-centered, but one who desired to live for all. I want to take you now to chapter 3 of Philippians. We just read our key verse in Philippians 1. Now come with me to chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 4. And if you have your Bibles, verse 4 Paul says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, 
If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I for more. Why is that, Brother Paul? Verse 5, he says, Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul was unashamed. And Paul says, I will never be ashamed of the gospel. It's interesting that Paul says, I had a very good background. I was a persecutor of the church and I was famous for that. I was seen as a zealous person. I am a descendant of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. I had nothing in the past to be ashamed of. To be associated with Christ at that particular time was something not popular to do. You would be looked down upon and you would be persecuted. But Paul forsakes all of that. Now here's the first point. You cannot be unashamed if you will have no encounter with Christ. Because let me tell you something, what the world offers looks so attractive. What the world offers looks so good. And in order for you to stand against what the world offers, in order for you to reject what the world offers, something has to happen to you which is greater than what the world offers. If you don't find something greater than what the world offers, you cannot reject what the world offers. As I told you, Paul takes over the book of Acts. He steals the spotlight. From chapter 1 to 6, he's not mentioned. Chapter 7, verse 38, the last verses, the Bible says he was holding the cloak of those who were stoning Stephen. That's when he's mentioned. When you get to chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says that he went about persecuting the church and pursuing people to arrest them. He received letters. And because of him persecuting the church, many Christians had to leave Jerusalem except the apostles. The Bible even says he went about breathing threats against the disciples and putting people in prison and killing people. Paul was so zealous to destroy the church. In fact, in Acts chapter 25, 26, somewhere there when he gives his testimony before Agrippa of Festus, he says, I was known and everyone in Jerusalem knows me. I was persecuting the church. And Paul says, I wanted to annihilate the church. I wanted to destroy the church. That was his mission, to destroy the church. But in Acts chapter 9, Luke recounts that when he was going to Damascus to kill Christians that had fled in Damascus, and by the way, the Bible says he was throwing into prison children, women, and men. He did not care. And as he was heading towards Damascus, he says that a bright light shone. And he recounts saying that it was brighter than the sun. He lost his sight. He heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he asks, is it you, Lord? And he says, and the Lord replies, he becomes blind for three days. Do you know what happens in those three days? Paul wept, he prayed, he didn't eat, so of course he was fasting. And the soul that people know from that day died. From that day on, it changed. His whole life changed. What happened is he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And all the things that to him were gain, he says, I count them but rubbish. His whole life changed. And if you continue to read in chapter 3, if you look at verse 7, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, 
More than that, I count all things to be lost in view, now listen very carefully, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. His supreme goal was not just to go out there. His supreme goal was not to preach Christ. His supreme goal was not to baptize, but Paul says the supreme value of knowing God. Did you know that you can preach, you can evangelize, and you can do all of these things, and you cannot know God, nor grow in your knowledge of God? I'm not talking about knowing a verse. I'm not talking about explaining a verse. I'm talking about knowing God himself. Paul says there's nothing of more value than that. There's nothing that surpasses that. Knowing God is the supreme thing. And he says, I forsook all of those other things just to know God. And if you look in your Bibles, he continues. He says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He has given up prestige. He has given up honor. Paul was one of the... the, the he, he was, of course, a Pharisee, but Paul was very young. There are very few people who are allowed and permitted and accepted as Pharisees at a young age, and Paul was one of them. He was very intellectual. He had a good future ahead of him. He was probably going to end up as the high priest. But he says, I gave up all of those things so that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, not on the basis of work. So in the beginning of his ministry, Paul knew that good works will not give him righteousness. Good works will not make him holier, but only through Jesus Christ and the work of Christ, he knew he was going to be transformed. Now, I'm sure you have seen drawings of Paul. I'm sure you have seen on PowerPoint pictures of Paul. But I am yet to find an accurate portrait of Paul. In fact, every time I preach on, on something in which Paul is, is related to, and I want to put his picture on the PowerPoint, I struggle to find the right picture. Because I believe that until now, no one has the right portrait of Paul. I want to invite you to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, quickly, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Corinthians is just after Galatians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 now look at what Paul says in verse 22 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 22 Paul says are they Hebrews so am I are they Israelites so am I are they descendants of Abraham so am I are they servants of Christ I speak as if insane I more so in now listen very carefully listen very carefully in four more labors, in four more imprisonments. Listen, Paul lost count of how many times he was imprisoned. He was imprisoned so many times that he lost count. Let's continue to read. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five, 20, verse 24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. By the way, when he was stoned, the people stoned him until the point he could no longer move. And they thought he was dead. Now let me tell you something. When you are stoned, you know when they used to stone, they used to choose big stones. Because the stoning they did to kill a person. 
not to injure you, not to frighten you so you don't preach anymore, but it was a death sentence. When you were sentenced to be stoned, it was a death sentence. So they were trying to kill him, and they stoned him to the point where he could not move anymore, and he lied on the ground, and of course he was bleeding. And so they said, he's dead. They gave him a, a, a he, he's dead, DOA. And so they left him there, thinking that he was dead. Verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a, a day I have spent in the deep. Let's, verse 26. I have been on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers among false brethren, which I think is the most dangerous. And then he says in verse 27, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Besides the external pressure, besides the physical suffering, there's an internal suffering because I'm worried about the churches that I have preached to. I'm worried about the souls that have not received Christ. And so I am troubled and I want to share the gospel with them. And so when you look at verse 29, he says, they are weak. Who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. Verse 32, in Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hand. When people read the letters of Paul, they have this picture of a very handsome man, maybe tall, maybe short, but very good looking. Let me tell you something, Paul did not look how you thought he looked. According to what he says about him, and according to the record in Acts, when a person is stoned, you have scars. When you are stoned to the point where you can no longer move, you are going to get out of that definitely with scars on your face. Paul was a man, I think, who probably limped. A man who had scars on his face. He didn't look attractive. He wasn't the type who would be invited maybe or requested to be a model. He was probably the type people looked at and said, oh, what an ugly man. He was not very handsome. He was not very guapo. He was not very good looking. He was not the type of person you look at and you say, oh, surely God is going to use this man. What I want to tell you this morning is this, God is not looking only for the handsome. Or let me say, God is not looking for the handsome. God is not looking for those who... Who, who are popular, those who look attractive. No, 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 no. God is looking for anyone who is willing to allow him to use them. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says Paul himself writes of what people used to say about him. Verse 10 says, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. His letters are heavy, but his bodily presence is unimpressive. So it is there in black and white. His bodily presence was unimpressive. Come with me to Galatians, just after Corinth. The book of Galatians, chapter 6. And I invite you to verse, um, let's go to verse 17. After Paul has an encounter with Jesus Christ in chapter, in chapter 6 of Galatians 17, Paul says, 
From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the brandings of Jesus. I bear in my body the brandings of Jesus. Paul says, from now on, I don't belong to the world. From now on, I don't belong to, to the Jews. I belong to Christ. I have the markings of Christ in my body. I am sealed by Christ. Let no man trouble me. Christ will get my devotion. Christ will get my utmost attention. If there is anyone with whom I will spend most of my time with, it is Christ, not Facebook. Did you know that Facebook has become a god? Because people uh, scroll more and flip less the Bible. People spend more time with the Bible, or less time with the Bible, than they do with... Um, people spend less time with the Bible and more time with Facebook. Did you know that when people are watching TV, they are like this? They don't blink. But in church sleepy when people go to the theater they rarely talk to one another they pay attention on the theater but when they go to church they talk and when people are watching telenovela they don't like to be disturbed by a call or a text but when people come to church they text and call there was a movie that was out because I saw it being uh, publicized on Facebook and I have friends who were posting pictures at the theater on a Friday evening, which is Saturday, even if it was during the week, it, was, it would not be okay. People are unashamed to post about a secular movie that has nothing to do with Christ, and the Bible does not, uh, uh, the Bible does not prescribe. They are unashamed to put that up on Facebook, but they do not do that about God. They do not share God, but they share those things. Even if they shared about God, it is still not okay to share those things. For you cannot serve two masters. You can only serve one. For either you will love one and hate the other. But today people are unashamed for worldly things. People are unashamed to show their bodies, their intimate parts. They are unashamed. But to preach the gospel, they are ashamed. To stand up for truth, they are ashamed. When under pressure to drink or to do things that they should not do, they cannot say no. When invited to go clubbing, they cannot say no. They are ashamed to say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist youth. But when it comes to listen to secular things, to dress in a manner that the Bible does not prescribe, we are unashamed and we are bold to do so. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And all of those other things in the world I have given up because I have the chief thing, and that is Jesus Christ. This morning, we are going to look and how God can use us and what God can do in our lives. Now when you go to chapter 19 of the book of Acts when Paul was summoned by Jesus Christ, he spent three days fasting and praying. If you don't fast and if you don't pray, I do not advise you to go for voice of youth. Don't do that. When you go to the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 19, the seven sons of Sceva, they decided to imitate Paul and go out and cast demons. So they went to the demons and said, In the name of Paul, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, depart. Notice that they go in the name of Paul and in the name of Jesus. They go with the faith of Paul, not with their own faith. The demons said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but we don't know you. You know what the Bible says? The demons jumped on them, beat them. They ran away naked with wounds. The great controversy is not a joke. It's not a joke. But let me tell you something. When you have Jesus, the devil is a baby. 
The devil is a nobody before Jesus Christ. But be very careful. Do not play with the gospel. Do not play with the truth. The devil means business. He's serious with what he does. And we ought to be serious. But when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, everything flows, mission flows, and you have no reason to fear at all. And so in chapter 9, verse 13, when Ananias is told to go and anoint Paul and give, heal him so that he could have his sight back, you know what Ananias says? He says, how can you send me to such a man? I have heard about this man. He is the one persecuting the church. He is the one killing people. I am intrigued at the grace of Jesus Christ. Why didn't Jesus go and pick one of the Pharisees? Why didn't Jesus pick one of the other apostles there? Why not take someone else? Instead, he went for the number one murderer, the number one persecutor, the one whom the world did not even think of, the least expected, the murderer, and he appears unto him. Paul did not go looking for Jesus. He, what he was trying to do is uproot the Christian church, to destroy the Christian church, to annihilate the Christian church. Jesus goes and visits him. And what Jesus has done through him, any person who studies history, Christian or atheist, comes across the name of Paul. In fact, there are Christians, and I am embarrassed of them, who say that no one has had more impact on history than Paul. I don't think it's true because we would not have Paul if it were not for Jesus. And so it is Jesus who has had more impact in history, in Christian history, than Paul. Because without Jesus, Paul is nothing. And Paul himself says that without Christ, he's nothing. But God takes a hold of that man, <laughs> a persecutor, and turns him into a passionate preacher, a man who was feared, and turns him into a man who was loved. In fact, if you read his letters, he writes to the church, and he says, how I long for you with the love of Christ. I long to see you. My children, God had completely changed the man. When they heard about it, the Pharisees, they couldn't believe it, but the power of God was manifested. And so now this man prays, fasts, meditates on God's word. And in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Ghost comes and says, listen, you are going to go out and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. We are going to move to Acts chapter 19. Come with me to Acts chapter 19. Very quickly with me. And if you're there, say amen. If you are going out for Voice of Youth for a holiday, you're going to the wrong place and you're going for the wrong reason. I remember that there was a Voice of Youth. I went. There were three ladies and three guys actually there were five ladies and we were three gentlemen one gentleman courted the five girls in one week and according to him he loved every single one of them but unfortunately he forgot or he did not know that ladies talk so late in the evening, they sat around and they said, you know, this guy said he loves me. Oh, he also said he loves me. Oh, he also said he loves me. And they went around. Oh, he loves me, he loves me. And then they confronted him and then he comes to me, Kuya, what did I do wrong? Oh, boy. This was voice of youth. But the brother went for, vo I think he thought it was voice of love. <laughs> Some people go to voice of youth because food is guaranteed. <laughs> food is guaranteed for that whole period. And so they go. 
You are not a servant of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Paul says, if I were still seeking to serve people, to please people, I would not be a bond servant of God or of Jesus Christ. If you are going for voice of youth, for any other reason, other than knowing Jesus, the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ and growing in Christ, you are going for a mission impossible. You have already failed. But now let me tell you something. Even if you go with those reasons, <laughs> I am amazed at the grace of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because through the preaching and the service that you will conduct, God knows that there are people there who need the gospel desperately, he will use those words you are going to speak and the service you are going to give to save lives. The problem is that you are going to usher people into the kingdom and you will remain outside. You are going to welcome people and invite them, come on in and accept Jesus and enter the kingdom only to discover that you are going to lock the door after everyone is in with the key and you're going to throw away the key and remain outside of the kingdom and then it will be too late for you. Look at Judas. Ellen White says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He cast out demons. But Judas is going to hell. Look at Balaam in the Old Testament. He prophesied. He was a prophet filled with the Holy Spirit. He is going to hell. King Saul the first king of Israel. He prophesied many times. The Holy Spirit came upon him. In fact, even after he was rejected by God completely, the Holy Spirit still came upon him and he prophesied when he was hunting David to kill him. Just because I preach and I stand here does not mean I'm saved. Otherwise the devil would be saved. And going for voice of youth is not a guarantee of salvation. It's not. It's not. Now when you come with me to Acts chapter 19. Where shall we begin from? For time fails us. I want to invite you to verse 21. Now after these things... Acts chapter 19, 21. Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Verse 22. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About the time there occurred no small turbulence concerning the way. Verse 24. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. Verse 25. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. Let me tell you what's happening here. And then we'll read the rest. When Paul went to this place, there were silversmiths, goldsmiths, stonesmiths, and they used to make idols. And at this place, they used to worship Artemis. Or the shrines of Artemis. When Paul got to that city, Paul began to preach that idols are not gods. And we should not bow down to idols. The true God is Jehovah who is in heaven. And he was not created by men. And so the silversmiths and all of these people gathered together. And they called for an urgent board meeting. And they said we need to sit down because we have 
a serious problem. Come with me to verse 26 of Acts chapter 19. They said, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul persuades and turned away a considerable number of people saying that God made with hands were not God at all. 27. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. This is very shocking, very interesting, and very amazing. Paul goes to Ephesus and he begins to preach the gospel. The idol makers made their business of making idols and selling them. But when Paul went to Ephesus, their profit was declining. Not only was their, their profit declining, their business was about to be annihilated. Not only was their business about to be annihilated, but all of Asia was hearing the gospel of Paul, and Paul was having an impact on Asia. And all of this, let me remind you, lest you get lost in Paul and forget about the Christ in Paul, that all of this was possible because of Christ who was working through Paul. Amen? And so when Paul gets there, they check their balance sheets, they check everything in the stock market, and they realize their businesses are going down. And then they say, we need to have a meeting, urgent board meetings. They sent out a memo. All of those who are, who are selling shrines, they gathered at a place and they said, listen, this Paul is bringing problems in Asia and all throughout the world because our business is going down. We need to do something about this Paul. And he's convincing a lot of people. I hear people saying, you know, I just want to be a simple Christian. Let me tell you something. There's no such thing as a simple Christian. If when you mean simple, you mean humble. The Bible in, in, in Daniel chapter 6 says that Paul began to, not Paul, Daniel began to, to excel above all the others because he had an excellent spirit within him and then the bible says that joseph was blessed and joseph everywhere he went he outshined everybody because the lord was with him if you are a christian you cannot contain your influence hello you cannot live in a place and people do not know that you are living there your impact has to be felt because of the spirit that dwells within you. It has to be felt. Something has to happen. Something has to take place. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. After Jesus said, I am the light of the world, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And the light cannot be hid. Let them see your good works so that they can glorify your Father who is in heaven. A light is not supposed to be hid. If you are a light, then people will see you, they will see your good works, and your life will have an impact in your home, in your barangay, in your province, in your country, and it will have an impact on the whole world. The problem is this. In our communities, we are amongst the drunkards. Our fame is with the drunkards. For those who are guys, they, they are famous amongst those who are playboys. We have the fame that they have. 
and we impact in the way that they impact. Instead of being a blessing to the community, we are a curse to the community. You do not have to go far for voice of youth, though. Every single day of your life should be a voice of youth. If you only go, you know, let me tell you something. You know why many people go far for voice of youth? You know why? If they knock the door of their neighbors and they say, have you heard of Jesus? You, speaking of Jesus, I know you. You, you, I know you. So we go far where people don't know us. Where we can put on a holy religious look, a holy walk, taking the holy Bible, singing holy songs, on the holy Sabbath, preaching the holy message through the Holy Spirit. But when we come back, we live like devils. And then we want to go out for mission and live like saints, like angels. And that's why we go far. But if you have Christ, you don't need to go anywhere to minister. You'll start where you are. And it will be impossible for people not to know who you are. You cannot contain the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot keep it within. We are ashamed because we have not had a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. We are ashamed because although at a certain point we did actually have a genuine encounter, but we detached ourselves from Christ. We are caught up in doing things instead of being. We like to do religious things. We like to do things that Christians do, but we don't become Christians. I will continue to read from Acts chapter 19, verse 27. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Verse 34. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, this is another person, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted, now listen, as they shouted for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis for the Ephesians. For two hours, the whole city was in an uproar. The whole city stopped and there was confusion. And they were shouting, great is Artemis, because when Paul went to Ephesus, he preached Christ, and the Artemis, their god, and their shrines, and idol worship was going down. And so they were in an uproar. Do you know why we face little persecution? Because we are not living and preaching the gospel as we ought to. Acts chapter 20, 27 to 30. Right now we are just going to read verses. I have five minutes left. Is it 20? Yes. 21, Acts 21, 27 to 30. Verse 27 says the following. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him, seeing Paul, in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him. This is now in Jerusalem. 28. Crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man 
who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Verse 30. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Were shut. The last words of verse 31 says, Jerusalem was in confusion. Come with me to Acts 20, 17. Acts 20, 17. And I want you to read, forget verse 17. I want you to look at verse 19. Paul says that he was serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon through the plots of the Jews. Let me tell you something. If you don't face persecution, you're doing something wrong. If the devil doesn't disturb you, if the devil doesn't try to interrupt you, if the devil doesn't try to distract you, you are doing something wrong. But that doesn't mean you must now go and seek persecution. Do things so that you may be persecuted. But when you accept Christ, when you decide to obey Christ, the devil decides to focus on you. When you are for the world, the devil will not try to disturb you so much because you are not trouble to him. You are not a threat to him. So he, there's no reason to disturb you. Do you know what Ellen White says about, um, um, about John the Baptist? Ellen White says that when he stood up to preach, the devil was in fear of losing his kingdom. Did you hear that? When John the Baptist stood up to preach, Ellen White says the devil was in fear of losing his kingdom. Do you know how long John the Baptist lasted? They say approximately only six months. Do you know why? Because the devil was itchy. He couldn't, he was uncomfortable with John being alive. John was a threat to him. John was preaching the truth. There was a time king comes to listen to John preach. You know what happens? When the king comes, John says, hey you, you should not be married with the woman you're with. He was married to his relative. That's how he got his head cut off. He, he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming. You know what he said? You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring forth fruits appropriate to repentance. He went about preaching saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The devil said, I cannot have this man for long lasting. This man should not last for long. He got his head cut off. He prepared for his ministry more than he ministered. They say he prepared for approximately 20 years in the wilderness. Desire of Ages says he was meditating more on the book of Isaiah. And then he comes out only approximately six months he's done. And you know what? Jesus says among those born of women, there was no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus doesn't say there was no one greater than Moses, than Noah, than Enoch. All of those men were godly men who outlived John the Baptist. John the Baptist, they say, only ministered for approximately six months. But Jesus says there was no one greater born of woman than John the Baptist. Why? <laughs> John the Baptist was completely sold out to God. Let's come to an end. We're in Acts chapter 20. And I want you to look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plot of the Jews. How, now listen carefully, verse 20, how I did not shrink 
from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. I did not shrink. I was not ashamed to tell the truth. And then in verse 27, he says, for I did not shrink. He repeats it. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. We will end with verse 36 and 38. The Bible says when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would see his face, that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. Let me end with verse 24. Verse 24, Paul says, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. I do not live for myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. What is that ministry? To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God and to testify of the grace of God you don't need to go anywhere to do that. And you can only do that if you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ. We are missionaries for Jesus every day and every hour 24-7. But only if you have allowed Jesus to dwell in you. My dear friends, God is real. This book here, that today the world, and even unfortunately, some churches are putting away, and some of them in very subtle ways, in ways you cannot realize. Apart from the truth in here, and Jesus said, I am the truth, you will not find any purpose in life. You won't do that. There's nothing in the world that will give you joy apart from Jesus Christ. And unless you have Jesus Christ, you will not find peace anywhere else. All the water, all the things you pursue in life, you will find no joy in it. You will find no satisfaction in it. You do not come to Jesus to get something from Jesus. But we come to Jesus because we want to have a relationship with him. And when you have a relationship with Jesus, as Paul says, there's nothing that surpasses a knowledge of God, communion with God, fellowship with God, a connection with God. There's nothing that surpasses that. Once you have that, automatically you become a missionary. I would like to close with a word of prayer. And I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. There was a wonderful instrumental that was played earlier on. Can somebody play it for me? Or can someone play something? And listen, I, 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 I am not an entertainer. I, I, I did not come here to entertain you. But what I have presented to you, I have presented Jesus. How Jesus chose a man who was useless. A man who was fighting against him, Jesus took him, changed his life, and Jesus has given him the best, which is himself and an opportunity to live with him in heaven. I don't want you to go out for mission, invite people in the kingdom and remain out of the kingdom. My dream is to be with Christ today and forevermore. And I want you to meditate on your lives this morning. Are you really living for Christ? If you're not, your life is useless. It's in vain. It's rubbish. If Christ is not a part of your life, everything you are building is useless. If you spend more time on Facebook 
then meditating on God or on his word or on prayer it's in vain there's nothing wrong with Facebook but if you spend more time there if what you watch is useless if what you listen to if what you comment if what you read does not bring you closer to Christ and if it dis di disrupts your relationship with Christ it's vain if what you watch does not help you grow in Christ it's of the devil if what you listen to my friends is not gonna help you grow in Christ delete it delete it right after the service substitute it with something that will help you grow watch things that will help you grow listen to things that will help you delete those things it will lead you away from God it will not help you grow don't go out to do mission with the devil in your pocket don't go out to do mission with the devil on your phone or on the laptop you're not a missionary for Christ you're a missionary for Satan I want to make a special appeal for any person in this room who wants to be changed I am the first one you want to be transformed you don't have the strength maybe some of you are suffering with addictions maybe you're struggling spiritually but today God has spoken to you if God changed Paul God can change you God can use you Paul was a murderer some of you have not even taken a life before Paul was killing people, persecuting the church. God can use you. Any person here this morning who you had maybe turned your back on God, but today you want to come back, I want you to come up front. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I know there's somebody, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. Don't look around you, it's individual. Come on up front and let's pray. Come up front. There may be somebody here who's, or who has heard of the gospel, but you have not yet accepted Jesus as your personal savior. You have not accepted Jesus as your personal savior. Today is your chance. Jesus is not looking for the perfect. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. He wants the sinner he wants the weak, he wants the sinful, he wants those who haven't got it all figured out yet. Otherwise you wouldn't need him. He wants you to come for him. What is going to happen after I do this? That's none of your business. Your business is to accept Jesus and have faith in him and he will do the rest. You believe in him and he has never broken a promise. Before I pray, is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? God bless you all. God bless you all. Is there anybody else? The door is still open. This is your golden opportunity to rededicate yourself to Christ. To recommit yourself to Christ. And if you have not yet accepted Christ as your personal savior, this is your golden chance. Come up front and let us pray. As you meditate, Confess your sins to the Lord. Confess your sins to the Lord. And ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to cleanse you. Ask God that your goal will be Christ. Whether by life or by death. That Christ will be glorified in you. And through you. And that you will be a blessing wherever you go. Can I pray? Is there anybody else out there? Is there anybody else? Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for speaking to me and thank you for speaking through me. 
Lord, I need strength to live in accordance with your word. These people need strength to live in accordance with your word. These youth, Father, are seeking for joy and happiness in the wrong places. But they have come because they want you. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I plead that at this very moment, you may give them power. Give them power. Give them intimacy with you. May they hear your voice like never before. May they move as an army of youth, fearless towards the front line of the great controversy with Jesus before them. May the devil be in fear of losing his kingdom because of us. Father, we are not afraid because you are the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. There is no one like you and there will never be anyone like you. For as long as we are in you, we are safe. And we rejoice in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be unashamed of the gospel. I pray for those struggling with addictions, those struggling with sins. Lord, in Jesus' name, set them free. It may be telenovela. It may be series. It may be movies that have nothing to do with you. In fact, that lead them away from you. It may be that Facebook is taking too much time, Lord. It's taking too much time. And they cannot stop. But from today, they will stop in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that have been hurt, disappointed, broken, betrayed, for those that have had suicidal thoughts and maybe any other person here who thinks that it is better to die than to live. There's no need for them to die for their sins and guilt because Jesus already died for them. In Jesus' name I pray you give us all peace and that you send us forth for the furtherance of your gospel and that none of the things that the world may offer may move us except for the richness and fullness and the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Happy Sabbath. God be with you.